already on a hatchet uh, One thing before we get started, though, uh, as far as parking goes and things, if you notice, there's, uh, there's handicapped parking right here, right along the building, and you can come in, it'd probably be best through the front door. And if you park further out, just, just remember that it's, it's a pretty good little walk here. What we, uh, what we got permission and things to do now is, is you can park out behind the building here where the loading dock is, and you just come up to the door. Right when you come up to the loading dock here, there's a door uh, and you just hit the button and, and somebody will let you in. You can come right on up and just use the elevator. That's, that's probably the easiest as far as distance wise and things. I'm not so sure about on the street there and things with the legislature. They're not in right now, but if they're in special session, it'll be, who knows? <laughs> who knows what it'll be? <laughs> the, uh, but handicapped parking right in here, a little bit further out, it's a little bit more of a walk, but you can park behind the building and just come out, come right up and get the door, uh, the buzzer there. Is but that I, metered? Hmm? Is that metered out there? No, after five o'clock it is not metered. Don't about, don't have to put any money. How in. about this drink? No, 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 no. You, you might just want to say that that's on the night when we have lectures. Yep, that's out on the street there. I'm not really sure about when that would be. Um, what I would do is I would park out out behind here. The uh, you now as far as you know, like parking regular on Thursdays and things like that on the regular Thursdays it would be the parking would be a little bit further out but but on nights that we have lectures you can park in behind the uh, park in behind the building here and actually use the loading dock doors there okay and it's not snowing or anything so we're in good shape on that <laughs> but I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, West Virginia Archives and History Library as we can continue our uh, lecture series our upcoming lectures are posted on our website and it's wvculture.org backslash history. The, when you Google that, just Google uh, West Virginia Archives, and that'll be usually the first thing that'll come up will be our website. And you can see where the lectures that are upcoming things, there's several that's going to be coming up in May. We're still putting together one with, uh, hopefully with the Office of Tourism on some of the, uh, one of the systems that they have out there to actually find where a lot of these historical sites and things are, but we're still in the process of putting that, putting that one together. A little bit later in May is going to be one of the block series speakers. So just uh, take a look at our website. Uh, if we don't have your email, uh, what we do is we send out the e-blast for any, uh, any uh, lectures coming up and things. So if we have your email, we can send you the, uh, the web blast part, or the e-blast part of the, uh, That's, you can always go to our website though and any, any, any information on any of the events and things coming up, that'll be at where you'll be able to find it. For tonight, who has walked here before the Europeans? That question is on many of our minds as we walk these hills, ridges, and the waters of our state. Tonight, Darla Spencer, a registered professional archeologist and author who has researched the archaeology and early Native American history of West Virginia for more than 20 years, will shed light on this question and more as she presents tonight's lecture, Early Native Americans in West Virginia, the Fort Frontier Culture. Their Fort Ancient, Fort Ancient Culture. Please welcome Darla Spencer. Thank you everyone and thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I, I had a book published last October on this topic, obviously that's a book cover. And tonight I want to kind of give people a sort of a, a background on this and talk about some different um, artifacts we, we know, you know, these people used and, and sort, of, sort of about their life ways because of the artifacts that they used. And, uh, I talk about 16 different sites in the, yes. Can you speak a little louder, please? Can you hear me now? Very well. Let me turn it up. I think if you put it on the other side where it's facing you, it's facing away from you. Oh, okay. Is that how? Yeah. Yeah. Randy, turn it. 
Like I say, I was just wanting to give everyone a little background on the book and a little bit of the history about Fort Ancient. I do have books here if anyone wants to buy one. You're welcome to do that. Um, also, during the talk, if you have a question, I would just assume that you ask me then while we're on the topic. Uh, so and instead of waiting till the end, unless you want to. But that's fine with me. This is a timeline of uh, early history or prehistory in North America. And these are different periods, obviously. Uh, Paleo Indian were the first people we know that were in North America. The archaic people lived here for about 7,000 years, um, between 8,000 BC and 1,000 BC. And then the woodland people who made the mounds, the Adena and the Hopewell people, although we don't think we had Hopewell in West Virginia, but um, between 1,000 BC and 1,000 AD. And then you get to the late prehistoric or protohistoric period. And protohistoric is basically after European contact. And these are sites where you find European trade items. So that's the period we're going to talk about tonight. In West Virginia, it was uh, in the southern part of the state, it was Fort Ancient People. And that name has nothing to do with forts. Some people think it does. But um, it was given because um, there's a Fort Ancient, it's a Hopewell site in Ohio. And the people that named the culture thought it was a later site in it because it was so sophisticated. So they named the, the culture, Fort Ancient culture after that. But that's misleading because that's an earlier site. Basically, the Fort Ancient people were here from around AD 1000 to shortly before European contact. We don't know exactly the ending date. Um, but by the time the first Europeans came to the valley, they were not no longer there. The villages were abandoned. And at that period, they had larger villages than before. They lived along the major rivers. It was the first true agriculture. They were farmers. They had the bow and arrow. And they made shell timber pottery with mussel shell. And before that, the native people used grit or rock. They crushed rocks for timber. Uh, but these people started using mussel shell. And I'm sure it was a lot, a lot easier. And this is one rendition of a Fort Ancient village. They lived in circular villages with several rows of houses in a circle around an open central plaza area. They usually had at least one palisade wall surrounding it, maybe more than one. We found several that had more than one. And then this is the on the cover of the book. This is an artist's uh, portrayal of the Sunwatch Village in near Dayton, Ohio, and that's a Fort Ancient Village as well. So it's probably it's the only one that's been recreated, and it's a pretty good recreation. Although we have no idea of how the uh, roofs to the houses would have been if they were thatched or not, but um, at least the houses kind of fit the footprint. And again, the first thing were farmers, the first true agriculture. They grew corn, beans, squash, and sunflower. And they used the three sisters method of companion planting. And basically, with the three sisters method, they would plant corn and then plant beans. And the beans would bind up, up the corn stalk. And the squash would be around the, uh, the corn plant. And that would keep the weeds down. And corn had been recently developed in the in Mexico, and it was developed from a grass called teosinte. And the first corn was very small. And this is today's corn. Mm -hmm. These, this is cor uh, charred corn cobs from Roseberry Farm in Mason County on the Ohio River. And I don't have a scale, but they're pretty small. They were like they had eight eight rows or ten rows. And then they gradually got larger. And this was during the, when they had the bow and arrow. And it had been recently introduced, we think, from the north somewhere. So people were first using the bow and arrow. And it probably made hunting a lot easier. This is a flint napping kit from the orchard site in Mason County. 
and you can see the rows of arrows uh, and the um, the antler piece was a, a, for napping and then other tools that were used for plant napping. And this is some muscle shell timber. Yes. I have a question about the drills that were on the, the arrowhead slide. Uh -huh. uh, Darla, were they uh, drilling wampum or were they just using drills for multi-purpose drilling? Probably multi-purpose. I have no idea how they would do I mean, that would have to be so difficult. But you do find shell beads also, and they're so tiny and delicate. I don't know how they could have done it with a stone drill, but I guess they did. And again, this is uh, tempered with pressed mushroom shell. And this is a typical Madisonville style pot. It had cord marking on the outside and then smoothed or um, plain rims. So during this period, there were three cultural culture areas in West Virginia. Uh, in the southern part of the state was the Fort Ancient culture. In the northern panhandle, on the northern part of the state, was the Nongahela people. And in the eastern panhandle, the Susquehanna people lived. This is Fort Ancient territory. Basically, it's along the Ohio River from West Virginia in the east to Indiana in the west. And you can see there are a lot of sites from that period. These are some of the sites in West Virginia. And in the book, I talk about 16 different sites. I could have gone on forever, but I was limited by the number of words I could use. <laughs> Any questions? What's the closest site to Charleston? Marmette would be, or Burning Spring Branch, I'm going to talk about it later, but there were also two um, village sites at Marmette in the residential area, and they were lake sites. I talk about that, those in the book. Yes? Uh, where did they go and why did they leave? We have no idea. We really don't know. Um, pressures from maybe the northern the Iroquois nations, um, or the fur trade, or and we know that like the Seneca came down into West Virginia at certain times, but um, we really don't know. They, but there's no um, sign of epidemics like mass graves or anything. So we don't think they, you know, got smallpox or anything like that and died out. And they just, so they're going westward? I think so, but we don't really know. I got a question about Places in the Canal Valley that look like they would have been good to have a village site, right. but maybe they got farmed by Europeans so you know too soon before archaeology was even invented. Uh, do you? Is there anybody who's ever looked at, uh, tried to figure out if there were other sites that have now been ruined because of uh, previous? development by after Europeans came in. Has anybody ever done anything to try to well, figure that I mean, out? I've like look at private collections or something like that. Yeah, I've heard of several sites. One I think it was up near Deuce Pond, or I think it was Deuce Pond. And supposedly this was from one of the old timers, one of the collectors. That yeah. Once that was, uh, they started digging, they came up with shovels full of skeletons mm -hmm. and kind of bulldozed over the hill. That yeah. was something like that. But, um, so what, what we see on the map is what's known from archaeological right. uh, digs. There may have been other there may have been Fort H. Sure. Okay. That just haven't been discovered or, or uh, disturbed or, yeah. you know. <clears throat> this is an artist's rendition of Burning Spring Branch. This was a village that um, was discovered in the early, I think, 2001. And it was when the Army Corps of Engineers was doing the Marmot Loft expansion. And they hired an archaeological consultant, cultural resource analyst, who I used to work for, to do an archaeological survey. And they 
uncovered a garden there, and there was a, a village there that no one knew, had known was there before. So it had around 25 houses, it was a semi-circular village, um, two sides, it had the Canal River and Burning Spring Branch. And this is an artist rendition of Burning Spring Branch. This is an aerial view. Once the surface, they scraped the surface off and they found these post molds, and those are the little holes, the dots you see, where posts used to be. So there's the one that, that's across the, um, the screen in the middle is a palisade wall. And then you can see two houses pretty plainly. What have they done in that area? Have they what did they do? Did Yes, is it still open like that? No, it's gone. They pretty much demolished the site. That's why they had to do the survey. And they, they documented everything. About how far down is, is that, that layer, as far as what we're seeing there? How, how deep down in the dirt would that have been? It's usually under the plow zone, and that's sort of the um, depth that a plow will reach. I'm not sure if it's a foot, foot and a half. I have no, I have no real idea. But then usually they, once they strip the clouds and they find the sites. Is that, is that picture, is that your, your dig right there? Yeah, that's the village. Could LIDAR bring that up, that, you know, precisely, do you think? I don't know. Yes. I'm not sure. One interesting thing that was found at Burning Spring Branch that we hadn't seen before was pottery that had corn cob pressing on the, the rim. This is something you see in Virginia and you don't see in uh, West Virginia or Ohio or Kentucky. Is that the cob without the corn kernels? Yes. Okay. It's like a dried cob that's um, rubbed back and forth in a vertical motion on the, the rim of the vessel. And, and Usually things like this, like a lot of vessels are cord marked on the outside where they use a cord wrap paddle and beat the wet clay. And it was to help, it was decorative, but it was also to help with, um, keep it from being slippery when wet hot. So um, probably this was the same type of thing. But this is, like I said, this is uh, something you find in Virginia. And usually these are from sites that were occupied by Siouan speaking people like the two loans of Pony. So that kind of indicates that some of these folks may have also spoken to a language. We're trying to figure out who the four inch people were. And it's very hard. Um, a lot of people think that they, a lot of archaeologists think that they were Shawnee or, or early Shawnee, proto-Shawnee. But there's also some indication that some may have been Siouan speakers. And it could have been the, could have been Shawnee men taking Sioux and wives because women typically made the pottery, but that's just one theory. There was a little pottery jar found also. It could have been a paint pot or maybe made for a child. There were clay pipes, and these are kind of an unusual form, kind of a jagged form. And this, there was a similar pipe found in Man in Logan County. Man's another four inch. Yes. What's the uh, significance of the uh, checkered pattern below the, the object? The what now? What's the uh, significance of the checkered pattern below That's the object? That's a scale to show you how large it is. Those are centimeters. Okay. Right. There were a lot of deer bone beads, and these are usually made from deer leg bones, and they're polished and smooth, and then sometimes they would string them. Um, there have been people that have been found with like, skirts of deer bones, which would take a lot of deer bones. <laughs> Bone tools, a needle on an awl, and stone and clay discs, and these are also called discoidals, and we think that they were either, there may have been game pieces that were used for a game similar to Chunky, which was played by historic tribes, um, or like the ones at the center hole could have been used as weights for fishing, for fishing nets. And 
The other side I'm going to talk about is the Buffalo side in Putnam County. And it's basically, it's on the uh, right bank of the Kanawha River below the town of Buffalo. And if you can see this, like semicircle, mm -hmm. that's one of the villages. There were two overlapping villages. This is the other. And this is usually the Bidden area, which is an area where trash was dumped around this the inside of the palisade, and it shows up lighter than um, than the soil. But this is um, this would have been the downstream or the um, the later village. There was one village that was occupied in the 1200s, and the, the later village was occupied sometime in the 1600s. And that was the one that was excavated about 15 to 20 percent. You'll see the personal showing the different palisades. And they may have had more than one, but they also may have been where they were repaired over time, too. downstream village. This is the one that was, these are the excavations, and these are the houses. And you can see that they're in a circular pattern around the central open plaza area, too. And this is some of the pottery from the Buffalo site. This is cord marking. a lot of triangular arrow points. Bone hairpins. Um, these are combs. There are also metal tubes. Buffalo, the, the uh, downstream village, the lake village was occupied after European contact. So there was European metal at the site. And um, this was traded inland from native groups probably along the coast. These are shell ear ornaments made out of marine shell. And you can see how they were worn. I think these were typically worn by men, but I'm not sure. And here's some European metal. And they would, these were from like copper or brass kettles. They would cut out different um, shapes of animals and these the mouth, I assume, and the fish. But they also made uh, tubes, cones, and sometimes these were sewn on the garments. Like um, if anyone's ever been to a powwow, they have jingle dancers today, and sometimes they'll sew uh, metal cones onto their dress to make it jingle. And we think that that's how they use those. Yes. Are those effigies that came with coal? Are any of what? The effigies, the two effigies you have there, are they are the material is that came with coal? What is that made out of? Is that metal? Is that metal? Oh, okay. Oh, you mean the animals? I thought it was came with coal. No, those are those are made from metal. Okay. Grass or copper. They've never been tested, so. But the metal wouldn't have been available until after European contact? Well, there was native copper that came okay. from the Great Lakes region. And you have to do a, a chemical analysis to find out which, which type of copper it would be. And these are some of the many pendants and um, ornaments found at Buffalo. Um, some of these are cannel coal. use deer amber tips for uh, projectile points as well. And bone fish hooks, these are pretty common. You find these a lot on ranch sites. Bone whistles, um, these are made from turkey leg bone. They're very small. And we think these may have been game pieces also. 
Because there are a lot of those and I don't know what other purpose they would have had. But. And these are more just oils. And again, probably gaming pieces or weights. Muscle shell hose and stone hose. And the mussel shell was from the river. Um, they would put a hole in it and they would insert a stick to use the handle to uh, dig fields. And then there were a few pipes, not a lot of pipes from Buffalo, but there's a platform pipe and some sort of bird, maybe a falcon or something. And that was like a serpent or an animal head, and this looks like a human, probably a human face. It was a lot of marine shell found, and again, this came from the um, coast, uh, or a lot, of, a lot of it came from the eastern Tennessee region, but they were made from hiking <coughs> whelks, typically, and um, you only find these in the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. There were a lot of marine shell found, and this was again freighted down the line from native groups. Um, in eastern Tennessee, particularly, they made a lot of marine shell ornaments. In, in 1928, we Meyer uh, compiled a map of a lot of the Indian trails in eastern North America, and um, the red trail there is called, he called it the Great Indian Warpath. And the Ohio branch stretched from um, the eastern Tennessee region up through southwestern Virginia, up to the Kanawha River, and then across the Ohio into Ohio and to the Great Lakes. And that's probably the route that a lot of these items were, took um, being traded back and forth We find a lot of the shell gorges, especially in southwestern Virginia, along the, the route and then in the Canal River. And this is a really nice um, weeping eye green shell mask. It's one of the nicest ones, and it was found at Buffalo. Rattlesnake Gorge from Buffalo. These are, um, you find a lot of these style, they're, they're very similar. But you have the, the rattlesnake eye, the rattlesnake head, mouth, and then it's coiled around, and there's the rattle. What is it? Rattlesnake. small marine shell maskets that were made similar to the large masks, but you don't find these in the southeast. You just tend to be in Fort Angel territory. So we think they were made here. Uh, a lot of times they were made from discarded shell or other masks or, or gorges. But they are very small, less than three inches across. And sometimes they are gray in the weak knife style. Fort Angel is not a tribe, is it? No, it's a, it's just an area, Section. just a culture that where people lived in West Virginia and the Ohio River, and we don't know again what what uh, historic tribe it would have been related to. We're not sure. A lot of people think Shawnee. Um, it's just hard to say. Are there burial mounds associated with that culture? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Burial mounds? No, they didn't make burial mounds no. at this time. That was earlier. And these are little clay figures from Buffalo. And um, you can see they're different. There's a human torso, head. Well, they say black bear, but it could be something else. And this little arm has what looks like tattoo markings. <laughs> so they possibly tattooed themselves.
And there were some animal cutouts again from European metal trade items. And some glass beads. And then this is a twisted red glass bead. Brass cone. And some of the variety of green <coughs> on there. And again, you have the rattlesnake gorget, the weeping eye mask. Um, this one is a cruciform style gorget. It's almost Celtic in design, but I don't think there were any Celts here at that time. And this one is similar to, uh, you find spider gorgeous in the Mississippi Valley from this period. You don't find them here, but this is, I think it's a snapping turtle that it has a circle and cross on its back, and that's kind of a motif you see a lot in um, this period. The size of that is one inch, one inch square, is that what that is? Yeah. So did those shells, even though you talked about them, you know, trading them from you know, the ocean, were those shells maybe found in the rivers with, you know, like just mussels and things that you know, no, mussels don't last as long as these. These are really hard, the whelk shells, and um, they just tend to last longer. And these scales are not right. These are a lot larger than that. I don't know where that came from. But I know this one is probably two and a half to three inches across. That one's larger, so I don't know. Those are, those are the problem. Maybe one inch is just the white part. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. They're showing you the, the width and then compare that to one inch, the, the little white square. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dawn, I might mention that too. Uh, since we're talking about these patterns, in historic American Indians, which they would sign their names, they were in these patterns in historic american indians when they would sign a treaty and i'm talking in the 18th century or the 17th century if their clan membership was in the turtle clan, they put a cross in the middle of the turtle shell, right. similar to what you see there. So that's that's a good guess uh, that this archaeological, or this piece from archaeology from prehistoric period, if there is such a thing as connection historically, and that's a really good guess that that represents a turtle, yeah. snapping turtle. Yeah. Are you saying the mussel shell came from the ocean? Yes. So Not the mussel shell, but the. Well, well, shells. The stuff they used for hose was coming out of these stuff. Well, hose, hose are made from muscle shells. Right. Yes. But these are not hose. You're right. Yeah. That's what <laughs> and just these said. are very hard. I tried to, uh, mm -hmm. using a stone drill, tried to drill a hole, and it took like, it took a long time. They're yeah. so hard. If, if you have found muscle shell hose, you know you can rub those yeah, and apart. it comes apart. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. I, I was in on the Buffalo site in 1963. Yeah. I was. Yeah young 13 year old a veteran <laughs> running around behind Dr. McMichael oh wow so, you, you should be giving a talk at another time because you know, I want to hear what you what you had to say I hear the story. <laughs> yeah but you're saying there was travel involved if some of these things come from the ocean right and usually that that one route that's because the oceans covered the whole world one time <laughs> not at that time <laughs> <laughs> that's but good that Okay. Um, yeah, they they did. They traded a lot of things. Now they traded the muscle or not the muscle shell, but the um, ornaments a lot earlier than that was like the late archaic period, which was roughly um, a thousand BC. That was the late latest period. They started coming into the the Ohio Valley, but the the. Uh, Engraved ones are a little bit later. That map that you had with that red line that right. went up, isn't that just the New River Gorge? I mean, well, part of it the is. New River part of it, right? Basin. You go up the New River to the canal, yeah. Because it starts in North Carolina. Yeah, they Carolina. followed the, yeah, yeah, followed those routes. And this is out of focus a little bit, but this is a, a nice, um, these are olivella shells and uh, marine shell disc beads from the orchard side. And this is in Mason County, above the mouth of the canal. And this is a marine shell pendant from the same side. 
and pipes. Mm -hmm. Pipes are a really neat, I think, uh, artifact because they don't have a set form. Well, some do. Some you find like this in the basket form. You find some of these um, platform. But uh, it seemed like the artist had a lot of leeway with these and made many different types of animals and um, forms. And there's a, a fish head, a vulture. The question is, what were they smoking? <laughs> tobacco. <laughs> they, they smoked tobacco. Tobacco. I thought uh, peyote and all that sort of thing was. The what? Peyote. I've read anyway. Not. I don't think that was here. That's out west, maybe. Oh, but, out west. Okay. Yeah. This is really a nice pipe. And these are some more from the orchard side. There were over 50 pipes down at the orchard side. I guess that's a bear. This is a buffalo energy pipe. You see the hooves and the, uh, the horns. And these are some more um, green shell ear spools and a bone beamer. And a beamer was used for uh, scraping hides. It was made out of bone, I think probably deer bone. And then pottery. There were a lot of different um, types of pottery, but basically the, what they call a Madisonville style, which a lot of Port Angel people made, was with a smooth neck and, and rim, and then cord marking on the body. And this has four strap handles. And this has lizard effigies around the top. These might be human, I can't tell. That's what it looks like to me. The human effigy handles, which are kind of unusual. And more lizards. And these are all from the orchard side. How often are they found in that intact a condition? Not very often. <laughs> Usually there's not much, you know, just some shirts. And this is a turtle shell rattle which ports um, pebbles and drumfish bones from Portugal. And metal artifacts again, and metal band, armband, clips, maybe hair tubes or tubes and tinklers. And to finish, this is something that was very personal. I was doing a a project where I was studying some of the pottery and uh, looking for the corn cob pottery, and I found this shirt with a uh, fingerprint on it <laughs> from a potter that lived a little bit more than 350 years ago. <laughs> and I thought that was really neat. So, are there any questions? Are all these kept in the archives before? Um, no, they have the, all the potteries up at Grave Creek Mound at that repository. That's where our state repository is. Okay. And a lot of them are up there. Yeah. So what do you look at, uh, what items do you look at to date the site and also to decide how long they occupied the site? Well, um, for one thing, you, you can tell if it's pre or post European contact from the From the metal line. Uh, usually with the palisade walls, if there are um, many palace, like many rows of post molds, you know that it was either repaired or rebuilt over time. Mm -hmm. And same thing with the houses. If you find house patterns that may be overlaying each other, you know that that was repair. And uh, you can tell that way. And just different artifacts you find that were later. But it's really hard to say. And um, they can do um, radiocarbon dating. That'll just be for certain items. Right. The carbon. Right. Like I assume that wouldn't work for clay. Is that true or anything? No, I don't think so. It's going to be organic. Okay. Yeah. Right. That would make sense. Yes. So about how how big was the Fort Ancient culture? How what's what was 
the population of that. I don't know that anybody knows yeah, that really. We know, I mean, there are a lot of sites, you saw the one map, and it shows most of the sites. And you figure, I know at Buffalo, they excavated 15 to 20 percent, and uh, I think it was estimated there were a thousand, over a thousand burials that they encountered. So you figure there were several thousand people living there, you know, over this period of time. And it was a, it was a larger site. Some of the sites aren't that big, but there were so many. Those were whole body burials, not cremated right, remains? Right, Yeah, they didn't do cremation that often. That was more earlier. The uh, Adina and Hopewell, I guess. Right. Darla, to identify a camp, let's say, of mm -hmm. Fort Ancient, would, basically you'd have to look for the same types of artifacts, right? right. But, but not, you wouldn't typically see post molds or anything like that, like well, a rock shelter. Maybe a lean-to lean right. or something like that. Okay. Yes. How was the uh, shape of those potteries determined? Well, that's a I'm sorry? How was the shape of the potteries that we saw? How was that shape determined? How did they make it? They made it, it was coils, coils of clay. And they would start at the bottom and coil up, and at the time they would probably put their hands in and hit it with a quarter paddle or a flat paddle. And um, that was made that way, shaped by hand. I ask a question, this is uh, maybe asking you to speculate, uh -huh. but do you think, say, the Adena, the Hopewell, and the Fort Ancient peoples were absolutely separate peoples, or was there maybe just a development of different cultures over time? Probably a development over time. Probably developed different uh, cultural traits, started, make, started living in larger villages, that type of thing. We don't know. They used to think archaeologists would always say that, you know, somebody, they were the Adena, and then the Hopewell came in and moved those people out. Well, they don't say that so much anymore. They think it was probably a, a development in place. It was a transition from mining to gathering yeah. and farming. The loss of these settlements, the loss of these settlements and, and peoples, were they directly or indirectly tied to the European invasion? Um, they were indirect, but they didn't, by the time the, the Europeans came, which was in the 1700s, at least here, uh, they were gone. Well, they were gone before that. Yeah. No. So, but there were tribes that, were you talking about, like DeSoto? No, in gen generally speaking, because I guess you have the Western tribes and everything else. Generally speaking, the European invasion caused the loss of a lot of Native Americans, is that right. correct or not? Well, yeah, there were certain, yeah. So, I would say so. in our area, if they, they had already left, you're saying? Oh, look at this area. Look good. Yes. What do you know about Canal City? It was a nice, big, flat area. I actually grew up in Canal City. <laughs> Roosevelt Avenue, you know where that is? Yeah, it's a nice area. I live, I live on Washington, uh -huh. and there's a lot of time I can't dig in my yard. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm up on a knoll, okay. and I know that about a block, maybe a block and a half, there was an Indian mound there that they had leveled. Right. And I, I often wondered if I wasn't sitting on top of something like that because right. of the elevation. <laughs> and every time I dig in the ground, I find stuff. Yeah. Well, I know at Marmette in the residential area, and I can't remember what streets or anything, but they found when the residents would dig like for a garage or something, they would find um, all, all kinds of things. Yeah. So there was a village right there. People lived there before too, same place. Mine had to be a very busy village, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> close to the mountains and close to the river, right, right in between. So I was kind of wondering if there maybe possibly wasn't a village in there someplace. I don't know. I don't know. I've heard of one, but that doesn't mean, you know, there couldn't be. Um, I noticed they always um, set up a village along the main rivers. Right. But now, if they branch off from that, like, would they set up, you know, the camps? How long would they stay at a camp? Because I'm finding some really neat arrowheads right. and stuff in my front yard on my farm in Jackson right. County. Well, that could be from our earlier period too. But then I, they think that, um, like in the fall, that there would be groups of people that would go gather nuts, for example. 
So they would be in a different area, and there would, there would be artifacts there too from that. But because um, I was just wondering, like, because our property has you know, a lot of rock shelters and natural right. springs on the property. Yeah. In Probably get a lot more activity during the arcade and that type thing when they were after hunter and gatherers. And the farm next to ours has a big Indian mound on it. Okay. So I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah. We're about some Jackson County. Yes. Yeah. Southern Jackson County. Southern. Well, there ever any so like, isolated bands of the, of the, uh, the indigenous people here after the arrival of the immigrants? Yeah. Well, after the arrival of Europeans? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. I've read, um, well, Doug, you might know this better than I. What was that? I did, there's another conversation going on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I couldn't. Didn't hear. No. What was said? You were asking about, uh, like, historic trials in West Virginia. And I know what people have. I don't know much about those. I, I isolated bands that, that, that survived after the uh, immigrants came here. Wait a minute. That remained, you mean? Yes. Uh, there don't seem to be any that remain. There were some in West Virginia. Now there were some who moved, historic Indians, Shawnees, Delawares, Wyandots, um, who moved further west but maintained ties with the landscape here and then later on some of their descendants came back. Cornstalk was uh, mm -hmm. Deepak, Deepak the Americans. Pleasant, you know, the first battle of the Revolutionary War. But he came but, right down Three Mile Creek that she showed you on that one site there. Cornstalk came right down across the Ohio River and attacked, uh, attacked General Lewis from Lewisburg. He brought the volunteers here. What tribe was he? They were. Shaw. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Darla mentioned Bulltown. I don't know if you heard her say Bulltown. That was a, a historic. American Indian town in the 1760s, I think, mm -hmm. uh, into the 1770s, um, up around where Bull Town, where Burnsville Lake is now. And there were others in the historic period, not many in the historic period, but there were a few identified in the historic period. Uh, but like she said, in the, the cusp of the prehistoric and the historic period is what's called the protohistoric period. And there were a lot more villages in the protohistoric period than in the historic period. So <laughs> something happened that most everybody left out. And a good hypothesis, because it's supported by historic and prehistoric evidence, or protohistoric evidence in the ground, is that the folks who were living here, whoever they were, from about, six, about 1630 until about 1690, they were pushed out one way or another by the Iroquois expanding their influence in the region. And the Iroquois, of course, were equipped with guns by that time. So there's your... Hey, hey, what, what was that time period again? About 1630 to 1690 is when there was a... Um, you said the Iroquois had guns? Yeah. They've been trading with the Dutch and then later the English in getting guns uh, pretty early. So it gave them an advantage over the people in their high valley. It was a pretty big advantage. And uh, so they expanded into the region at that time, and uh, a lot of folks left out or were made prisoners. There was one priest, a Jesuit priest, amongst the Iroquois, in the, uh, or amongst the, the Hurons, who spoke about the Iroquois Wars, and he said, and this is like middle 1600s, he said, there are no more purebloods among the Iroquois <laughs> because they're incessant wars. They've lost so many people, and they've had to replace them with people from other places. That there, there are no more purebloods amongst them. Now that could be hyperbole, but the, the main point for us today is I that, think that I think the, the issue here would be what is pure blood. Right, right. No. And, and it's and nothing out there pure blood. No, and in his mind, there was. Uh, but he, he was making a point, not about really about their blood, but making a point that they had lost so many people in their wars, see that. and they had to replace them with other people. Yeah. But they also did it to prevent incest within a tribe, too. Yeah, but what, I, what I'm getting at here is that that was one of the actions that they took in the Ohio Valley region. A lot of the people that they conquered became prisoners and then adopted into uh, the Iroquois, the different Iroquois tribes. So there was something happening in that period, and it happens to coincide with this 
big decrease in village sites between the proto-historic period and the historic period right here in West Virginia. Hmm. So it's good question. kids. Yeah, um, how would you characterize like what we would have known say about the folk fort ancient culture 50 or so years ago and how that knowledge has advanced in the last half century? Well actually um, James Griffin wrote in 1943 this published about the Fort Ancient Aspect, and he kind of defined it. Um, the, the, the house changed. There have been a lot more sites, and um, archaeologists have just investigated a lot more sites, such as Burning Spring Branch. Uh, Buffalo was excavated in the early 1960s, but they're um, they're just a lot more known about, I guess I would say. There's nothing left to see in Buffalo or Marmette. No well, there's site. a lot left in sight. There is? Yeah. There is. They only excavated part of it. So it's there in the field. It's just... It's not visible. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. It's below the plow zone. Yeah. <laughs> Darla, I was wondering if there was any evidence that the, the archaic peoples uh, did anything to exploit the salt resources of the area. We know how desperately right. important that was to Europeans sure. and not so much to to later or later American Indian peoples but what about those earlier peoples were they exporting salt in any way that you could tell uh, I would say I would think so now Burning Spring Branch is there's a, there's a salt spring there and I think that's probably why people settled there and they did that from early on there was a, a later site there some woodland people there and then the Fort Ancient Period site. So I think that there were people there for thousands of years, yes. Yeah, that makes sense that it they were, it wasn't just a coincidence that they were at those sites that still had salt. Right. But I didn't know if maybe you found any vessels that might have had concentrated salt residue in it. Actually, they have salt pans, pans. Which, and I assume that's what they're for, and they're kind of a wide, flat, bowl-shaped, sometimes rectangular. Mm -hmm. So that's probably, you know, I'm sure for evaporation, true. they weren't necessarily boiled dry right, so. into cakes. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Anyone else? This is kind of on a rabbit trail here, but is anybody up to date on what's going to happen to Shawnee Golf Course? Well, actually, I was interviewed for that, and the reporter got it wrong. <laughs> she said that there was. The, the mound was empty, and uh, the way that the Dunbar Mound, she was asking about that, and the way that the Bureau of Ethnology from the Smithsonian excavated, they dug a trench or a shaft straight down from the top, and they would take what they found, and probably the burials, as well as the artifacts, back to the Smithsonian. Now, that doesn't mean they excavated around that, so there's quite a bit of remaining mound there that probably contains features many burials but I told her that but she didn't read that email. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> I know that whole area down there is oh, yeah. enormous. Yeah. And, uh, Why did they do that? Why did they take the artifacts and to study it? It should be here but they study sure. it. They, and they, they pack they're it still. up and put it uh, right. Just like South Charleston now. It's, it's been completely yeah, but, uh, Clean, clean well, again, you know, just the shaft. So, I mean, there could South be... South Charleston? Yeah. They did the same thing? They did the same thing. Although, when they got to the bottom, and there was a, a structure down there. Um, so, I'm not sure how much is left of that, the original. Now, that's the Adena culture? Yeah. And how, what, what period of time? Um, that's roughly <coughs> 1,000 B.C. up to maybe 100, 400 A.D. Most of the mounds were built after 500 BC, late. So uh, I'm going to do, actually, I'm trying to get permission to do another book on the Adena because most people know about the mounds. Oh, yeah. And I think it would be more interest. Yes? What time period did the Smithsonian do that shaft? That was in the, the 1880s. And the, like the South Charleston Mounds, mm -hmm. was, the excavations began in 1883. And just to say, I mean, I agree with you, the stuff should be here now, but 
at least it is somewhere where other researchers can go and look at it. Uh, and back in that day, there was nowhere in West Virginia that could have safely uh, stored those materials. But, but now there are. We can petition. Right, we can back petition. to our museum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> you know, along those lines, just like with Civil War sites, a lot of people like to collect that stuff, but it completely takes it out of context and it loses all of its archaeological value if it's just removed from the site and uh, put in a collection, uh, particularly a private collection somewhere. Right. Great. Good point. Yes? I've been involved in it, Dig, and um, I was under the assumption too about that buffalo uh, dig that you guys did, that uh, you would dig so much and then you would rather leave everything intact rather than go in there and dig the whole site. Because at least maybe maybe 20 years down the road there may be better ways to do a dig that maybe there's still site there that you can find out more information about what you got going on there. And remember this was done in the early 1960s too. So oh was it? Yeah. I'm sorry. And it costs money to do these things. <laughs> That's right. And, and do like right. a, yeah. a large dig like that yeah. could cost you know thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. To dig instead of loot. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they felt it was going to be disturbed or destroyed by development. That's why they did it. So yeah. I see. there's a lot of it left. When they started, when they started the Buffalo dig, Dr. McMichael's came to the Kamal chapter with the Archaeological Society. And we were in a plot, a ten by ten plot for one year for one dollar. And Dr. McMichael supervised our dig all summer long. I was 13 years old then. But uh, I'm a lot of artifacts. Boxes. But they, they fully wanted us to come and help with the labor is what it was. Are there law, laws in place? For, are they laws in place? Like say if I found something extraordinary on my property. Well, particularly against burials, about, you know, not just burials. Really? That's uh, LA, actually. There's state law. And uh, there are not really laws against digging on your own property for just artifacts. Although again, if you have a site, then taking that away kind of disturbs the, the integrity of the site. Mm -hmm. You know, an archaeologist can tell you maybe a little bit more about it from that. But, uh, you know, people do that all the time pretty much, especially on their own property. Yeah, they have tons of YouTube videos, guys digging underneath rock shelters and right. stuff. And right, right. private property. Finding a lot of stuff. Yeah, you know, there's folks that do a lot of, as far as, you know, looking for like arrowheads and things like that, which that's what well, my question was. The triangular arrowhead, that was primarily the Fort Ancient? That was an arrow point, yes. Okay. Because you find a lot of them, like I think Terry mentioned, down on the, uh, around Point Pleasant, down that oh, area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of sites in that area. Darla, could you put your timeline up there along the lines of what, what we're talking about right now? If you could put that, can you go back to that timeline and uh, show everybody where, where the bow and arrow comes in on the timeline? Because I think a lot of people have trouble understanding that the really big stone points are not from an arrow or spears. So if you could go to the timeline and say right here this is when we know that bows were in use in our area and before that not so much well basically it's right before um Fort Asian period right around a thousand eighty <coughs> this is basically Fort Asian period in the in the southern part of the state so right around that period there were several developments that and uh horn horn had just come in very late actually right so when you find the little tiny triangular points you know you're at a thousand a.d or after they used the handles too prior to that um, now if you find a big one spears were still being made 
So you can find a big one that's right. 1,000 AD or after, but uh, when you find a cluster and it's all the big ones and no little ones, then chances are you're looking at a site that's before right. 1,000 AD. The bow and arrow were like the nuclear arms race. <laughs> it's more like down to St. Albans, the site down there from like 85 BC or 8500 BC where they had the large. Where's that? St. Albans. Where at St. Albans? As you're going, as you're going down the river there, mm -hmm. there's a historical marker. Oh, is that right? Going there. toward the uh, Buffalo? No, going yeah. Look, you know where the old, you know where going the, down the river? You know where the Department of Highways garage is in, in St. Albans on the river? Oh, there. Department of okay. Highways garage. Right okay. the the That's the site? Yeah. Not much okay. to see, okay. but. But the part of the river has fallen in since mm -hmm. then. And that's the the Paleo Indian period. What now? Is it the Paleo Indian period, 12,000 BC? Well, they think it's even earlier. They're not sure when the first. Is that when the thought is they crossed the Bering Strait from. Right. That's the. That's but they the think it's even earlier than this now, and they keep finding earlier and earlier sites, so mm -hmm. it's still up in the air. That's the time period of the St. Albans site. Well, that's more okay. Well, they're, did they find, they found no paleo points at St. Albans, right? I don't think they found any. No, they found but they were, points. they were in the early, Clovis. what's that? They found Clovis At St. Albans? St. Albans yeah. yeah. okay. wasn't yeah. first. Well, wait a minute now, but that was the paleo period. Yeah. Uh, but primarily archaic and forward is what they found and what I think maybe what Randy's getting at um, that was a really important site oh, definitely. because on the map. every time frame with changes in weaponry and, and tools was found there and it was all stratified and yeah. everything was sealed with a layer of mud and silk from a flood episode, so everything was intact and they could date, you know, date all that. And several harps where they could actually get some carbon dates. So those artifacts are where now? Ohio. Um, <laughs> no, I think they're probably up well, at Great Creek. That's where most things are. The, the Ohio um, State Museum has a pile of that stuff. From St. Right? Albans? From St. Albans. Yes, they have a, yeah. an exhibit on it. Oh. We have the paper portion of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have the paper portion of the report that they that right. they generated when they uh, they did the dig. And and people can come here and look at it, can't they? Yep. What year was it? Right at this point. Put in the plug. <laughs> it was it was pretty early. I think she said 1880s. No, well, not, not that early. No, no, no. <laughs> 1960s. Sixties, so sixties. Okay. Uh -huh. no. St. Albans. I think all the publications also of the Western Archaeological Society are here too for, for viewing them. Betty Broyles, a female archaeologist, put that on the map at the St. Albans site. Mm -hmm. You can read about it here. Yep. Yes. You can read about it here. Right here in this building, in this, right here. Yep. Talk to Randy. Go see Randy. <laughs> Talk to Terry. That, that goes along with also with the Arab as part of the. Uh, there's a large collection of arrowheads here in the museum, and uh, Jim Mitchell would be the person to, uh, you better have some time to talk to Jim Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to tell you a lot about them. Thank you. Anyone else? Carla, I wonder if you would expand a little bit on some current hypotheses. I've, I've read uh, about this potential Sioux and connection. Right. Uh, is there anything else you want to tell us that maybe you didn't tell us about that? And what you know, what is leading other people to think that this may be the case with some of the Fort Ancient sites right. in in the region here? Well it basically because of the position of Fort Ancient culture in West Virginia is between Sioux and sites to the um, east and Shawnee probably in the Ohio Valley. So, uh, but the core cob press pottery is basically the big thing. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the, the type of pottery they have over there in Virginia. And um, Keith Egloff, who's he was with the Department of Historic Resources over there, said that he, the only place he'd ever found that was on suicide. Mm -hmm. So I did, you know, study on like 13,000 pieces of pottery looking for that stuff. And that's where I found fair press. 
13,000 pieces of pottery <laughs> that woman there went through. Wow. Carefully. That's very impressive. Uh, both of you mentioned the term Suleans. It sounded like you were saying Suleans. What, what does that mean? People that spoke the Suleans language, like... Um, the, oh, what kind of language? Suleans, like the Lakota or Dakota, those people, but there were some in Virginia as well. Uh, the Saponi people, the Tudelo people, the Okanichi people, they all spoke a similar language. And um, they made a certain type of pottery, at least some of them did. And, and how is that Suleans spelled? S-I-O-U-A-N. Or, or just in general, the name for that language family, another name is S-I-O-U-X. Right, Sue. Yeah. Sue. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Catawba is a Suan tongue as well. Catawba. Which there are still Catawba people living in the borderlands of North Carolina and South Carolina. I've seen that. I used to work at a facility in Virginia called yeah, there's a town in Virginia called Catawba. There's a place along the Monongahela River called Catawba. Uh, and there's a tree called Catawba, but it's from, originally from Catawba. Uh, okay. Any other questions? I'm trying to think in the dates of the bow and arrow. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out. 1,000 A.D. 1,000 A.D. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. The arrow planted I found in my front yard is that, is that triangle. So it is actual. Got a little ear on the bottom. Yeah. It still could be an arrow if it's small. It still could be an arrow point if it's small. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> what about some of the writings that you see? I've seen in the West Virginia magazine the writings on the rocks. Was that done by the Indians? Well, I think it's most archaeologists think it was. And it's that probably the Irish monks. I don't know if it's natural. It's pretty far fetched. This here is something. I mean, I found that in the same show. Yes. That one's big I brought an artifact. I was hoping somebody might be able to identify. I found it on my farm up in Rome County. Ah, uh -huh. interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's been more for sure. I don't know why there's a hole in it though. Worn out. It's worn out. Yeah, yeah. No telling from when. Right. Yeah. Stone things like that are. Quite often room? archaic. Yeah. You know, sim sort of sort of primitive. Quite often. Where's your farm? Uh, I will say County. Frontier uh, Europeans also use things like this sometimes for uh, oh, if, they, if they were making uh, like a, a wooden pole, I can't even think now what I'm trying to think of, but they would sometimes need to smooth the end of it. Right. And they would sometimes use sandstone for that as well. Right. I know there's a lot of sandstone work yeah. in that area. But I don't know what yeah. that but is. But this wasn't in a populated area. Right, right. That's where the area had been bulldozed. Yeah. You can and see the grooves where they, yeah, they did was, something that was to, work. to yeah. work it. Probably with metal. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It would be nice to have a program that that uh, you could help us identify some of the things that we find and right. we're curious about. Everybody bring their stuff. Why not? <laughs> and get it from an expert. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You can speculate better than much that's good. <laughs> in front of the, where they would crush nuts or something. I'll let you say I brought the copies of my book if anyone's interested. I'll take around a little while. How much are they? How much are they? 20? Thank you. 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 Thank you.